Hey there, and welcome to The Aspiring Professional. I'm your host, Michael Simonton, and each week I'll be joined by a professional to talk about some of the traits and qualities that guided them to their success. Through this, we hope to provide some insights and advice for all of the aspiring professionals out there to help propel them along their journey to success. Thank you for joining us. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to hit subscribe so that each week you can get more of this awesome content. Hey, good morning, John. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, I'm about halfway through this cup of coffee. So good. So good. How are you, man? I am, you know, do about the same, you know, um, halfway through this. It's not actually coffee. I called it coffee a second ago, but it's a mushroom hero tea. Uh, so it's got all the, the healthy antibodies and stuff like that in it. It's great for right in the morning or like late at night. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I just got, I got four shots of espresso and some hot water. So cafe Americano. Looks like you're, you're fired up for the day then, sir. Yeah. Um, I've been fired up, you know, I've been, um, kind of taking a leave from work for the last uh, few weeks due to this whole pandemic thing. Um, just at home, homeschooling, Aiden and stuff like that. So coffee has been a ritual every morning and afternoon and evening. So awesome, man. That's amazing. I love it. So, you know, yeah, no, so like I was saying earlier, um, and the, the whole point of this is it's going to be for a platform and a podcast for all those aspiring professionals where they can come to to pull some tips, tricks, and advice to figure out what they're going for in life, you know, to help like get advice from those individuals who are a couple steps ahead of them who have the real practical information. So a little less of the like, you know, um, high level perspective and more of like the nitty gritty details and like what got these people to where they are today, because these are the actionable steps that, you know, us aspiring professionals can take to get there too. So, you know, without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. First question here is, who are you? What do you do? And how'd you get there? And you can take however long you'd like to answer this because I understand that is three <laughs> questions. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, my name is John Pisani. Um, I am a Starbucks store manager and I'm a freelance photographer. Um, the journey to becoming a Starbucks store manager, whether I thought about it or not, actually started. Um, when I was 19, so what, in 2007 ish, um, I became, I, I got a part time job making sandwiches at Panera Bread. And um, about a year and a half, two years into that job, I uh, became a supervisor and then found myself on a, as an assistant manager and uh, working at, a, a, you know, several different locations over the next, you know, few years. Um, I liked what I was doing. I enjoyed the business analytics. I enjoyed the ownership that was required of me in order to be successful. And I say that ownership is required of you because if you don't take ownership in your job, you know, the, and that pride that comes with it, um, it, it becomes hard to be successful to a certain degree, in my opinion. Um, and then also I, I kind of fell in love with my job because of relationships I was able to form with my employees. You know, I think service industry kind of, it's a tough industry, um, but, you know, when you're in it for a long time, you kind of develop those relationships with those employees, you know, and you find something that you like and you kind of just go with it. I didn't think it was necessary to maybe go to college. So I just, I was like, hey, I'm making good money. I like what I'm doing. Um, I was working for a concept that had a, a good business model and I agreed with it and I wanted to kind of, you know, help build the company that they that they saw. So, yeah. Um, I guess over the last decade, um, I've, you know, I worked for Panera, became a general manager and, you know, eventually left that company, um, and started working for Starbucks coffee company. Mm -hmm. And I would say over the last decade in the service industry as a manager, I've been able to become well equipped. Um, and here I am running a medium volume drive through location for Starbucks in Indian Harbor beach, Florida. And, um, it's honestly been the highlight of my career. And it's, I'm running an operation for a company that I truly enjoy working for. Absolutely. And I've been to that location uh, and it's beautiful. Like you run a, you run a tight ship there, sir. I, I'm proud of you for it, man. Cause I, you know, <laughs> we, we came, 
how we met was you were my um, manager back at Panera quite some time ago. And, you know, since yeah. then we just kind of bounced around and you continue to get to know each other, work for each, work with and for each other. And then, you know, here we are today. So that's cool. I love that. Especially that, that key element of ownership there because ownership I found to be like an extremely important trait. And it kind of leads me into this next question, which is, you know, what are the three traits? Like, what would you attribute your success to? So it all started with one thing. And um, I've kind of lived by this philosophy since I became a manager, you know, many, many years ago. And it was don't be the boss or person you dread working with. And I start with that one, because if you if you want to be like, in my case, I wanted to become a manager. So when I was, you know, looking ahead at what being a manager would be like, I had to kind of visualize myself as that manager. And I was like, okay, so uh, w what kind of manager do I want to be? I'm like, well, first of all, I don't want to be the manager that everyone, you know, doesn't look forward to working with because as a manager, you're a leader. Um, and if you can't lead the people because they don't like you or agree with how you lead, then it's going to be difficult to motivate the people that are, you know, putting in the work for you, you know, like, you know, that's important. The other one, uh, I would say growth mindset and agility. We're, you know, in my, in my field, we're so driven about by consumer trends and um, technology is another piece that is huge with mobile order pay, delivery, and just the amount of, information that customers can consume, you know, digitally. Um, so, you know, with that, our company had to move with this growth mindset and agility around technology as a professional, as a manager, I have to have that growth mindset that we're not going to always do things the same way. Uh, we will have to adjust. And then once we adjust, we'll have to check and then we'll have to align. Right. And then we'll have to adjust again. And mm -hmm. so if you don't have that growth mindset, then you're going to be stuck in this. Well, I don't want to do it this way. Why can't we stay doing it that way? And you're not going to grow, right? And you're going to get frustrated and you're not going to uh, perform the way you should be at your job. And the agility goes along with that. I think execution, um, you know, my, you know, my experience, I've seen many managers uh, or employees that they don't move with that agility. You know, we don't execute as quickly as we need. We talk and talk and talk about the changes that are coming. But when it's time to make those changes and adjustments, we don't act with immediacy. We're not, you know, agile with it. Uh, so you end up, you know, being behind the curve. So that's another one. And then, you know, I, I use, I say this one all the time to people that, I'm looking to develop or come to me wanting to develop. And, and I tell them, if you plan to move up with a company, don't wear the hat, in my case, of the barista. Be in the supervisor mindset. You know, because if you just, if you want to be a supervisor and you always have that, that barista hat on, then you're, you're always going to be in that barista mindset. You have to shift your mindset from the position that you're in into what it's like in that next position. So if I was a supervisor, I was, you know, a few years ago, um, I, I couldn't think like a supervisor. Now, granted, I had general manager experience. So it was, you know, it was hard for me to think at a baseline level. To step back exactly, into that. Exactly. But, you know, when I have people that I'm developing and I've promoted, well, I haven't promoted personally people from supervisor to manager. That's not what I do, but I develop people that want to be a manager that are in that supervisor position. And I always tell them, think in terms of being a manager because you have to get your mind okay. ready for that. And when you get your mind ready for that, the person that's promoting you and interviewing you and ultimately making that decision, um, it needs to be able to see that you're in that mindset. Okay. I love it. That's awesome. So we got like, the, um, don't be the person you don't want to be in the room. Yep. Or don't the person be the person you don't want to work with in the room, you know, right. um, a growth mindset and agility, and then basically a forward thinking. Exactly. So like, you know, like placing yourself, in the future as the individual doing the job, you know, so take on those responsibilities, take, have that forward tilt, if you want to call it, um, where you're pursuing that. That's awesome. That's some solid advice. I think that, uh, myself, I could have used hearing that a couple years ago. Um, especially the, 
the element of thinking as the, you know, your your next position and you know putting yourself in that position where you're making those calls as an a store manager or as an assistant manager before you've been there that way it gives you that more of the almost even more of the ownership element too yeah and when when you do that it kind of enables you to peek behind the curtain a little bit and look at the position that you say you want um, because there's been times where people are like, oh yeah, I want to be a supervisor. And then they become a supervisor and they're like, oh, this is horrible. I'm like I have to, I'm in charge of all this. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, it's your supervisor. So you asked for this, you asked for this, but you didn't. And, you know, and I, I'm using that as a specific example because this person was someone that was promoted that got promoted on a whim and they never really expressed that interest and never really was able to engage that mindset. So, okay. So it, it also allows with the preparedness and, you know, making sure that's ac- what you actually want. Yeah. Awesome. So then like with that in mind, you know, moving forward with that mindset four years ago, was there a piece of advice mm-hmm. that you would have given yourself to like tie it all in together or yeah. to help use? Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this question and you know, when I look back at where I was four years ago, I was thinking about being where I am today. Um, I guess I would tell my younger self to keep my head down and continue to work hard. My opportunity to become a store manager kind of came randomly. Um, I had to be patient, you know, I, I quit my GM position at Panera and I had to ultimately wait four years to become a store manager. And in between that, I was, you know, working part time as a supervisor. I was eventually got promoted to an assistant manager. Um, I, I guess I, <laughs> I guess I would have, you know, told myself, hey, you know, sometimes things take a little bit longer. Be patient, and I was. I'm at a point in my life where I had to, um, the risk versus reward, I had to kind of take moderately. I couldn't make, you know, I made a quick decision to quit my job and work go work for a new company, with the assumption that I would get to store manager a little bit quicker. Um. So we know when you're younger, you know, I'm, I'm 32 years old. I have a family, um, and I, you know, I have financial obligations and stuff like that. When you're younger, you tend to have a few less financial obligations and you have more time in your life to fix things if you make a wrong decision. But what I'm saying here, what I really mean is I played the moderate card. I had to be patient. I could have quit the job. I almost did, as you know. And, Mm -hmm. but I held out and I got promoted at Starbucks and, you know, it ended up working out. Now, in the meantime, while I was, I had some extra time on my hands when I wasn't a GM, I was a supervisor. I was working on something else in my life. And, um, I was working on becoming a photographer, you know, just kind of started out as a hobby. And now it's kind of like a little side hustle. So I guess, you know, if I were to tell myself anything my younger self four years ago, be like, Hey, um, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer to get to where you want to be, but work on that side, work on that side hustle, because if you put all your eggs in one basket, you know, you might come out on the other end, a little shorthanded. Now, if you work on a career path and then you have something going on the side, um, I think you'll come out better for it. And honestly, I can say that, it was a good, it was a good, it was a good mindset to have for me. Okay. Yeah. It allows you to, you know, it allows you something that's completely within your control too. to to work on, to put all your energy into or the extra energy into so that that sense of control can definitely help with mindset. Do you mind expounding on that a little bit? You said you started out as a hobby. Where's it at now? Um, What do you do now with it? I mean, I have a website. It's the space coast I primarily shoot, you know, as a hobbyist photographer, I mainly shoot rocket launches, nature, uh, night sky landscape, stuff like that. But those skills can be used in things like real estate photography, um, which I do. I'm a, you know, I even went out and got my um, unmanned aircraft system uh, certificate so I can actually fly commercially with a drone and take pictures and video and stuff like that. And, you know, that was a whole learning process in itself studying for that FAA exam, but as far as the photography side, you know, it, it's, it kind of, you know, you sell a few prints here and there, then your name gets out there, you go shoot a house in my case, and, you know, I've been shooting real estate photography 
I shoot a one to two houses every month, month and a half, you know, it just depends on the market. Um, and then with my rocket launch photography, I've actually had some, I actually have a paid gig coming up. I've been helping out, you know, sometimes I've licensed some of my photos. So really it was just the last few years of just building a portfolio and kind of honing my craft, so to speak. It's not just, it's not something that you can just jump into and, be good at make a ton of money at right away it's something that you have to work at so yeah love it man love it that's awesome i think you know a lot of people could really use that 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 advice to to not put all their eggs in one basket but also to, to have that like that passion project that side hobby that thing that they really love doing to help fuel them throughout all those other elements of their life that they don't always consider yeah i guess it was you know you know as a I guess, I don't know, I, I, as a food service manager, I used to, I used to struggle with that work-life balance. And as I've gotten older, I've been able to define that balance and keep it balanced regularly. Um, but having that hobby and something that you're passionate about, um, whether it makes you money on the side or not, is it's essential to, you know, have a good life, in my opinion. You know, if, okay. if you don't have that, if you go to work every day and you give it your all, awesome, great job. But if you come home with that cup empty and then have nothing to fill that cup up for you, then how are you going to go back to work the next day, the next week, the next month, and then still pour it out to all the different jobs and things that you're taking care of and the people that you're, you're motivating and influencing? So you have to have something that fills your cup outside of work. Absolutely. That that's awesome. That's a that's a golden nugget right there. Honestly, man, it, it's uh it's it's evasive. Um, it's hard to get sometimes, but once you find it, hold on to it, and yeah. So you mentioned how, as you've gotten older, you found that work life balance a little easier. Do you think that's because you've you know, maybe you know learned more skills, or you've just you've grown into it? Why do you think that is? Um, a lot of it has to do with the company I work for. Starbucks has been um, an amazing company to work for. I, I really, so I guess, uh, let me let me back up a little bit. So, you know, when I worked at Panera, it was a good company. I worked for a franchise that was, they made a lot of money. Uh, they made a lot of money because everything was now, 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 and their managers worked their butt off to make that happen. Um, when you pull 50, 60 hour weeks plus, that becomes very tiring. Now, when you work for a company like Starbucks, a large corporation, it's company operated. Um, they give you the tools and resources that you need to be successful. You have the time to be successful if you're good at your job as far as like planning and prioritizing and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's, it has to do with a little bit about who you work for and then also your skill set as, as a professional. Um, you know, I work 40, 45 hour weeks, you know, that doesn't mean that my phone doesn't ring at 4.30 in the morning sometimes or 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. You know, those are one-offs. They don't happen a lot. Um, but I work very hard to build a team that is capable of handling issues when they arise, not always having to go to me. Um, so work-life balance, well, it all starts in the workplace, right? Because if, if your workplace isn't operating on all cylinders, um, then they're going to constantly be bothering you. Well, at least in my field. So I make sure that my team knows how to take care of things. And then you also have to set yourself boundaries. You know, there's times that my days off or um, times when I leave for the day after working nine hours or 10 hours or whatever, and I'm like, I'm going home. And if someone calls you from work and you've already worked your day, you know, you have to politely either not answer that or go to voicemail or um, call them back or answer the phone and be like, hey, you know, what do you need? Okay. And all right, well, can this, this can wait till tomorrow. And a lot of times it's one of those things that it can wait till tomorrow. You know what I mean? So drawing up those boundaries with the people you work with is, is important. Otherwise it'll be bothering you all, all hours of the day. You know, that's specific to, you know, my industries, but. I think that's, I think that applies to almost all. Cause like when you, without yeah. boundaries, it's just, it's anything goes, but with that, like, especially with tech, like technology and having a cell phone, like, you're, it's almost like a leash that someone can always have on you. And if they ever want something, they just, you know, yank on it or a bell. Yeah. So yeah, boundaries are important. 
you know, and it's, you know, the text message here, text message there, you know, it happens, it's fine, but over time, all that adds up, you know, and it's, um, you know, people talk about work-life balance, and you think about yourself, but you also have to think about the people that you're around, that you share that home with, right, that, that life balance. So if you're constantly taking a two-minute phone call here, a 30-second text message there, what, what message does that send to the people in your household? You know, it, work-life balance goes beyond you personally and your work. You know, it's, all, it's about the people that's around you as well. So you want to be able to send the right message. No, awesome. That's, that's phenomenal, man. Sin- seriously. So back to those questions. Uh, how did the realities met and your expectations align? Did you find that you'd created this false image of what the future would hold? And then when you got there, it was just, it wasn't that or what happened? Um, I would say in the last five years, my, my personal goals and expectations were a little, were a little off. Um, you know, I, I quit my job like on a whim and then I, I got a new job and, you know, I took a huge pay cut, I went from a GM to supervisor and expected to get back into that manager role within one or two years based on the information that I was given at the interview. It took me a little bit longer, so that sucked, but, you know, realistically, it, it, I'm okay with how it worked out. Um, I would say, though, your goals and expectations, they need to be reasonable. You'll have to act with a little risk if you are very ambitious with those goals and expectations. Um, now, for me, I didn't want to risk too much, so I could have left Starbucks, and I talked about that briefly earlier, but I, I could have left the company and got another job somewhere else, but I would have basically started at the bottom again and have to work my way back up. So it's like I'm already two years into this journey, and I see opportunity sprouting up around me. It's just not coming my way right now. You know, there was things like market growth, like we we're opening new stores in our market, and you know, manager turn and stuff like that. Like it all happens. I, I just had to wait, you know, a year and a half longer to really get to that where I wanted to be. Um, you know, things always change, and especially in large corporations. So don't be afraid to check and adjust your goals from time to time. But if you're super invested in something and you can't risk losing that investment, then just be patient, stick it out, do what you can. I had a side hustle going, so it was kind of helping me financially a little bit to bridge that gap. And it was enabling me to be a little bit more patient and kind of hang out while I waited for that store manager to position. Okay. So I think, I think quite a few people have so far and what I've heard is that setting realistic expectations is something that we kind of all struggle with because we, we imagine I, I definitely experienced this recently. It's called the um, the planning fallacy, where it's like you you imagine the almost the ideal scenario, and then when it starts unfolding, you realize that you forgot all these minute details that add up and make that time frame expand like twice its size. And yeah, I mean, it's like it's it's like like if you if you if you have this, I like this end goal of like, I want to be, a, uh, I want to climb Mount Everest, right? Well, you've never climbed a mountain in your life. Okay. That's a great goal to have, but what, what, like, <laughs> what set of goals are you going to have on the way to that? And I think a lot of people kind of forget that there's a journey that's not always linear. It's going to be up. It's going to be down. It's going to be left. It's going to be right. And you have to be able to act with agility in those moments and, reset your your goals and your intentions in order to realign your trajectory to that end goal and sometimes a lot of people miss that or what ends up happening is they get broadsided by something they get pushed completely off their path and then they they abandon they abandon ship like i'm not climbing mount everest anymore Mm -hmm. that hill was horrible uh so you know they they just kind of abandon that that hope and dream they go on to something else and you know, if you just would have stuck with it, maybe planned a little bit better and set some reasonable goals and expectations and aligned when you needed to, you could get there. And you would have gotten there. Yeah. So then would that be the advice you give to any young aspiring professionals out there or do you have something else? Um, 
I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of my answers were already written down and stuff like that. But I, I left yeah. that one. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't answer that one. You know, um, <laughs> beforehand because I wanted to see how this conversation went and kind of see where it left my mind. And I would say, yeah. I mean, having reasonable expectations and goals in life is. I, I think that's. I feel like that should be a known thing, right? You, you should. Mm-hmm. You know. You, I feel like people look at these Instagram influencers or YouTube creators and whatever. And it's like, Oh man, I want to be that person. But they don't realize what went into becoming that. Right. If you want to be a doctor, like, you know, go for it. Absolutely. Okay. If that's your dream and that's your passion, go for it. If you want to be the president of the United States, go for it, but don't get discouraged when things don't go right. Plan smartly. And honestly, if you, if you, don't leave work happy, then you're probably not in the right field. Should do what makes you happy. I hate to be cliche, but I mean, wow, you get one shot at life. Like, be happy while you're doing it because you need you need to work, I guess. Well, most of us do, so might as well be happy while doing it. They're called cliches because they're true and because these are like known things. It's not someone made this cool phrase and everyone calls it a cliche. No, this is this is like a proven truth that we've seen time and time again. And that's why it becomes a cliche. And that's that's something that I think people tend to forget about cliches is that they're actually very powerful when you think about them and take time to reflect on them uh, as opposed to just throwing it around. Because, no, you're like you're, you're absolutely right. If you aren't inspired and leaving your workplace happy and fulfilled, then you're probably in the wrong field and you will be nowhere near as successful as you could be doing something that you love. Yeah. So find that thing. Yeah, you know, um, when, I, when I think back on the last 10 years of my life, I was so concerned like in my 20s that I had to figure out what I was doing in life by the time I was 25. Here I am, I'm, you know, 32, and I'm just coming into where I I feel good. Like I feel good to be here for however long I need to be, and um, and I'm okay with that, you know. So don't feel like you need to figure everything out by the time you're 25 to 26, 27. You know what I mean? Like the 20s, that's just mess around, figure out what you want to do. You know, when you get to your 30s, then that's fine. <laughs> 20s are in the new 30 wait 20s are the new teens or something like that i forget there's a i heard someone throw that around recently yeah well i guess i've worked with a lot of young people over the years that are kind of like in high school to college age and so many of them feel so pressured to figure out what they want to do in life when they don't even really know themselves you kind of have to become an adult to kind of figure out how to be one right so i'm not saying that 20 year olds aren't adults or anything, but you're, you're kind of figuring everything out per se. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, and you don't really know what you want to be in. Like when you have such a narrow perspective of the world, because let's face it, most of us, we, we grew up and we kind of just watch those that came before us, like our parents and our fr- friend, our parents of the friends and like aunts and uncles. And that's our reality. Exactly. When you don't know all the options out there, it's hard to make an educated decision and to actually go after what you want. Yeah. I mean, and, and some people are fine with, you know, following in their parents' footsteps and, and kind of living with that view of the world. But other people, people like me, I had to get out and experience things of my own for so I can develop my own opinions and, 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 and just learn from the world. So, you know, that's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Just, you know, yeah, time is, time isn't free and time dwindles down, but, you know, don't be afraid to spend some of it figuring out who you truly are and what fills your cup. Absolutely, man. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for you know spending the time with me today. I in this conversation, I it's got a lot of golden like information and nuggets in there that I think a lot of us could really use to listen to, especially like if we're trying to figure stuff out. Because the point to your point, like you don't have to know all the answers. Like, that's kind of like anti you know against the the norm most people are like no you you need to know the answers you have all that pressure on you so i think it'd be good good for people to hear yeah you gotta spend time figured out but um you know thanks for having me on and um i wish you luck in this endeavor it's it's great to see that you're passionate about something and you're spreading that passion to other people in the world because you know i remember you when you were the young and aspiring professional and here you are now 
I'm still, I'm still aspiring, man. Always, you know, yeah. you are always trying to climb Everest and just taking it one, one little mountain at a time. Well, John, real quick. Thank you. If anyone wants to find you, where could they do that? Um, well, I, I mean, I post all my photography stuff, uh, John Pisani underscore photos on Instagram or John Pisani photo on Twitter. Um, you can always check out what I got posted on the space coast local.com. Um, if you ever need to reach out, want some more insight, you can reach out through one of those um, avenues there. And I'd be more than happy to spend a few moments of my life and chat with you. Perfect. Awesome, John. Thank you so much, sir. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, man. Cheers. Cheers.